I am so excited to be exploring the subject of smocking with you today. I just love it. It is one of those techniques that really shows attention to detail and it really does give your finished clothing that extra added wow factor. The stitches themselves are deceptively simple, but it can be incredibly frustrating trying to keep them straight and even but I have learned a few tips and techniques over the year that have helped me and I'll be sharing those with you today as well as how to do some of these stitches and some history. It is tedious but it gives you a lot of bang for your buck and there is nothing like that feeling of pride and accomplishment that comes along with finishing a project that includes a technique like smocking and it just plain looks cool. Hello friend, if we haven't met, welcome. I'm Lelena with Thimble and Plume and we are historical costumers and we love sharing the things that we've learned over the years in order to empower you to become the best costumer you can be. Let's talk about the supplies you'll need. The easiest thread to get a hold of is embroidery cotton. It comes in a variety of colors and it's inexpensive as well. You can also use a nice wool or silk that is intended for embroidery. For doing white work on a linen shirt, for example, you can use a linen thread of 35 when choosing a needle, the most important thing is to choose a needle that matches the thickness of your thread. So if you're using an embroidery floss, you'll want to use a cruel embroidery needle size 7 or 8 if you prefer something longer looking to darning needles. Whereas if you're sewing with a sewing thread, use the appropriate size needle for that. As far as fabric, you can really smock on just about any fiber. The most important thing is the characteristics of the fabric. You want it to be lightweight with a bit of a crispness in the hand. As far as 16th century goes, I have seen smocking done on both linen and wool. And if you're doing something like a shirt, you'll probably want to use linen, but you can substitute cotton if you choose. I also recommend starching your fabric to start out with for best results. And I will put a link in the description box below with a video that talks about how to do it. First, let's talk a little bit about what smocking is, as well as a little bit of history. Smocking refers to a fabric manipulation technique used to control fullness in fabric by gathering it up into pleats and securing them with decorative embroidery. Today, the term smocking conjures up images of English smocking as seen on heirloom garments and children's clothing, but the term doesn't show up until the 19th century, and the technique was named for the garment it was practiced on, the laborer smock. This garment employed embroidery as a means to decorate the pleats needed to control the fullness that allowed the workers the needed freedom of movement. Prior to that, we just don't know if there was a specific term used for the technique. So in order to differentiate, a broader term pleat work embroidery was coined to describe the practice and typically has been used when speaking about the garments of the 16th century and previous. And it is the term we'll be using from here on out. The earliest surviving example of pleat work embroidery is the alb of St. Hugo housed in a monastery in Switzerland in which the triangular top of a large gore is pleated using what can be described as a shearing technique to draw the fabric in to fit within the garment. This portrait of Albrecht Dürer shows the tiny pleats of the body of his shirt being held in place before being allowed to billow out below. Most likely this pleating would have been controlled with stitches in the back of the pleats. Moving into the early 1500s, the artwork shows embroidered designs now being used to decorate these pleats. Intricate embroidered designs and patterned ironing motifs on low neck shirts can be found in abundance depicted on men and women alike. Soon the necklines rose up to a high collar where the pleats were now being controlled by white work, pattern darning, shearing, and applied trims and laces. And this style lasted for a few decades before giving way to the shirts with a flat collar. Next, let's get into the types of pleat work embroidery that you see in the 16th century. English smocking is a type of pleat work embroidery that is formed by taking stitches around pleats to form lines, zigzags, and diamonds, and it has a slight elastic quality to it. This honeycomb stitch is a part of this family and can be seen on this surviving piece of sleeve found in a German monastery. The next style is pattern darning, where the fabric is gathered into tight pleats and then a running stitch is worked into and over the threads to create geometric designs. Pattern darning shows up often in artwork of the 16th century as well as in at least a couple of surviving garments. The Mary of Hungary blouse has a silver thread forming its design and in London there is a surviving example of a wool pattern darning on pleated wool fabric. The next type is called pattern shearing, where the fabric is pleated with a matching thread and the geometric designs are created as part of the pleating process, as we saw on this Alb of St. Hugo from the 12th century. 
Another option that is not technically pleat work embroidery, but is a means of decorating and controlling the pleats and is abundant in the artwork of the time, is to apply a brocaded trim or lace to the pleats as seen on this surviving lace cuff from the 16th century. So what can we discern by looking at the artwork and surviving garments from the period? Let's start with pleating. The pleats in this self-portrait by Albrecht Dürer are incredibly fine and shallow, and this is possible only if the fabric itself is very fine. This is also true of the pleats in the surviving Hemd of Mary of Hungary. It takes a lot of fabric to make these smock shirts, but by using shallower pleats you squeeze more fabric into a wider area and the less fabric you need. This fineness in pleating looks to continue into later shirts. Looking at how thin the edge of his collar ruffle is in this portrait of Matthaus Schwaz illustrates just how shallow in depth the pleats are. And getting back to design, let's decorate the pleats on the shirts we see in the 16th century. Portraits in the 16th century show many shirts displaying pleat work embroidery, and the majority do look to be pattern darning or applied trim. It is harder to find, but there are a few examples of what could be similar to today's English smocking stitches. If you've been following along with our Smocked Shirt Sew Along series, I've been working on putting together a German-inspired 16th century smocked shirt, and I've been researching and finding inspiration to guide me. Now, I've already done many shirts with pattern darning as well as honeycomb embroidery, so I wanted to try something different. I really wanted to look for something that was more similar to the English smocking or the more elastic smocking that we are, know today. Going back to the portraits and surviving examples, these also tend to be either honeycomb smocking or they're narrow strips and you see a zigzag or diamond design, which are then bordered on the top and bottom with some sort of straight stitch. Sometimes you can even see straight lines only used on top of the pleats to control them. Now I'm particularly drawn to the monochromatic color scheme that you see in these portraits. There's something very elegant in its simplicity and I'm just drawn to it. By keeping the stitching the same color as the fabric, it actually draws more attention to the manipulation of the fabric as opposed to the stitches. And I find that different and I really like it. So I've decided to go with white thread to use on top of my white linen. A very important step in pleat work embroidery is steaming and blocking your pleat. For pattern darning and applied trim, you'll want to do the steaming and the blocking first, whereas with English smocking, you'll be doing it afterwards. Let's look at how these techniques are done. For pattern darning and applied trim, you want your pleats to be very close together. So first off, you'll need to determine your finished size. You could either measure it or you can use a template that you have created. So you start out by pinning your work to one side of the board. Now since you'll be applying the embroidery while it's on the board, you do want one that is dedicated to the project. You can either purchase one or I have made my own in the past using a piece of board, some foam and a muslin cover. Once you have one side pinned in, pin the thread, gathering threads on the other side. I like to use a large pin and then I wrap the thread around it and then I plunge the thread into the board completely. Once that's done, you'll just adjust your pleats and fabric, running your fingers across them, getting them to the correct size as determined by your template. You can go in with, I have a skinny ruler here. You can also use like a credit card or something like that just to get your pleats nice and straight and flat and evenly spaced. Take your time do, doing this and make sure that everything is nice and straight and even. Once that's done, just secure the work to the board by pinning it at both the top and the bottom. And then you'll want to, to set it by steaming it in place. Then protect your pleats by covering them with a press cloth. Use your iron to steam them. Don't use any pressure, just steam at this point. For English style smocking, you'll do this after your stitching is done. So the procedure is very similar to previously, uh, but we are doing this after we have applied our embroidery. So compare the embroidery piece to the template that you're using and spread out the pleats so that they reach the size of the finished template. So you'll pin, once that's done, you'll pin it down to your 
ironing board. Now this is only going to be temporary, so you can actually use your ironing board. You don't have to have a dedicated space for this. Just go through and make sure everything matches with your template and pin it in place. And like before, you'll place your plush cloth over the top and use the steam from your iron to set those pleats. Once that's done, remove your press cloth and leave it to dry. When it is cool and dry, you can then remove it from your ironing board. Now let's talk about preparing your thread and threading your needle. Pull, you wanna pull your thread from the end with the long label. That means that you'll be threading it from the, with the thread grain. I'm using just regular DMC cotton here. And I'm gonna take two pulls of it basically, which is about right. So you're looking at about 18 to 24 inches. So what you've done that, what you want to do, this has six strands in it. So what you want to do is called stripping the thread. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out each one of these. So I'm going to puff the end here and I'll keep track of the end that is the end that you <laughs> pulled from because that's the side we want to go through the needle. So we've got six strands in here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take one of these strands and I'm going to pull it out. I'm pinching really hard so there's my first one okay so now that i have those stripped apart i'm going to take three of them i'm going to be sewing with three so i'll take three and put them back together now you may be saying okay well why did we go through all that hassle well these threads are going to be nice and flat when they come off the skein because of the manufacturing process. And But by doing this, we've fluffed up those fibers. So now we're going to have a nice fluffy thread that's going to cover more territory. So it's going to make for just a prettier stitch. Now I'm using purple thread here. This is not <laughs> uh, probably a buried color, um, but you'll be able to see it well. So I'm using a size eight Cool embroidering needle because I'm using three strands. This is a nice thickness because the hole that it makes will allow those threads to lie next to each other as they make their way across the pleats. Next we're going to go into some general tips and best practices for stitching your embroidery. First thing is you're going to use the lines of your gathering threads as the lines of your stitches. It's a lot like using the lined uh, lines of your paper to guide your writing. You'll use the lines of the gathering stitches to guide your stitching. We will be using a lot of half row stitching. So if you find yourself struggling and that it isn't lining up or you're having a hard time eyeballing it, what you can do is you can always go in and mark yourself your half rows with a waterproof marker or something. Just go through and do that. And you'll keep your needle perpendicular to the work. Also, when you're stitching, you want to be careful that you're not catching your gathering threads. So I'm coming in, I'm taking like a very narrow bit of my pleat here because I have very, very narrow pleats. So, but I'm not, I'm about a hair's breadth away from that. Before you begin, either mark a seam allowances or, or if you're, say, on this side, I didn't, you'll just skip your first three pleats and start on your fourth for your seam allowance. So you'll work from the left side of your work to the right side of your work, but your stitches will go in on the right side of the pleat and come out of the left side. If you're left-handed, it's opposite of that. And it's going to feel weird at first, but you'll get used to it. The other thing you'll want to do is you're going is you'll want to do your very first row. You'll want to use as a, con, a row to control. So then make sure that you do a stem do do some sort of straight stitch, a stem stitch, an outline stitch, a cable stitch, because it keeps everything in place. Those are nice tight stitches, and you want to keep everything in put in um, nice and tight and in place. And now that we are going to start stitching, we need to know how to secure our thread to the fabric. So here's how you do it using a smocker's knot. Let's say this is my first pleat here and this is my first row. So I'm gonna come in here. I want to start my thread at the bottom, but I wanna see where I'm at. So going into the valley of my first pleat, I'm gonna put my needle through. 
but I'm not going to go through all the way. And then I'm just going to pull it to the back. So now I see where I need to be. So I'm going to starting there. I'm going to go in until I my knot hits. Then I'm going to come back around and I will make a loop with that stitch. I'm going to stick my needle through that loop. Okay. Then I'm going to come back up through that hole, through that valley of that pleat. Okay. Then I'm going to go into the very top of this pleat here. Then I'll go through again, and that is the first stitch of my first pleat. And then I'm ready to move on to the rest of my stitching. And here's how you end your line of stitching. All right, let's talk about ending your stitch. When you get to the end of your stitch, first you want to say, okay, where would I have gone next? Like, so on this stitch in particular, the next step would be go, to go up. So I'm going to go, so what I want to do is I want to go into that area. I'm going to go in between the folds. I'm going to put it in between the folds towards the back behind that stitch. So that's what it looks like there. Okay. I'm going to turn it over. And then I'm going to do tie it off and I'll do that twice. So I'll go through the pleat. make a little knot. Oh, and now finally, let's talk about how to do the actual stitches. And I'll put that video here when it comes out.